Uh, hello, welcome to the new episode of uh, Turkey Talks. Today, our guest is uh, Farhan Chak from Qatar University. He is an expert on international relations and Middle Eastern affairs. Uh, yesterday uh, and the day before yesterday, there were talks between the Qatari government and the Turkish government. President Erdogan visited Qatar and uh, held talks with the uh, Emir of Qatar. And Turkey and Qatar has have signed uh, almost 15 different agreements, ranging from security uh, and economics to the cultural uh, relations. So we will be looking at the broader implications of this relationship, because uh, now it seems that there's a normalization process uh, among the Middle Eastern countries and among the Arab countries as well. Uh, Farhan, thank you very much for joining us today and accepting our invitation. I am sure that we will have a lively discussion on what's happening in the Middle East uh, and also between Turkey and Qatar. And also, as you know, uh, a few uh, weeks ago, uh, there was a visit from uh, UAE to Turkey. And also, I think we can uh, talk about a little bit on this issue. So what is your take on the uh, relationship between Qatar and Turkey and how you see it uh, as it is discussed in the in the Arab uh, countries? So it's a fantastic question, um, Brother Talib, Dr. Talib. And I, you know, I would like to say that I really appreciate being here with all of you. I watch your shows very carefully. I find them extremely informative and insightful. So coming to your question, this is the seventh meeting of the Turkey Qatar Supreme Strategic Committee. And what is so important about this partnership? And I think partnership, even the terminology partnership doesn't do it justice. What is so powerful about this kind of deep bond and this sense of brotherhood between these two countries is that every year, no matter how much depth and substantive depth this relationship kind of uh, facilitates, it continues to get deeper. As you mentioned, 15 new agreements have been signed from everything from sports, cultural, but most importantly, what cements it all is the vision that the two countries share for the region. And this is what really separates it. Now, there are no other two countries within the, the Middle Eastern region that so closely share this vision with Turkey, they reciprocate each other's trust in so many ways. Now, within the immediate neighborhood, I would say there's lukewarm to animosity towards the depth of this relationship. Even if it's superficially polite, even if, you know, UAE leading members of the UAE royal family will visit Turkey. Everybody in Turkey knows the role of the UAE in the coup, the role in the UAE in, in, in destabilizing, even before segments of Turkish society. So no one is overlooking that. No one's going to forget that either. But this is a major change. So I believe it's not normalization what's happening. I think the, the terminology should be corrected. What you have here is a jostling for position. It's like a wrestling match. Who gets to cement their position where? And, and what are they jostling for? They're jostling for proximity and influence over precisely this kind of rock, this rock in the region, which is this turkey Qatar partnership that is in one level was frightening people and now there's a type of jostling that can we squeeze in here there's a lot of other factors that you know i don't want to take too much in my opening kind of comments but i would like to add one more thing before i hand it back to you is that a lot of the reasons for the uae to reach out for turkey is because of the deep now animosity between the uae and saudi arabia and that's driving them now into okay uh, Qatar and Saudi Arabia developing their relationship to new levels and UAE and Turkey. So I think that plays a real factor. So there's a lot of jostling uh, and there's a lot of kind of securing their footwork. Uh, we don't know, but one thing for certain is this relationship between Turkey and Qatar is proving to be critical, a critical stable block that is growing in the region. 
Well, thank you for the introduction. I think you have already alluded to the next question that I was going to raise with you. You are right. I think that Turkey and Qatar, uh, they are becoming quite solid in their relationship, especially after 2016 and 17, when Qatar was blockaded by the rest of the uh, Gulf countries, I think. And the Gulf countries have uh, asked Qatar to uh, cut its relations with Turkey in order to be included in the family, but uh, Qatar uh, refused that. And despite the fact that Qatar refused it, I think uh, it seems that the uh, United Arab Emirates and to some extent Saudi Arabia, they are coming to terms with the regional reality, I think, uh, that uh, the Qatar and Turkey will remain as uh, very close allies and friends. But what else uh, has changed in the region that uh, uh, has also changed the minds of uh, uh, Gulf countries with regard to Turkey, with regard to Iran, with regard to Israel in the uh, last couple of years? Absolutely. What has changed as well, of course, as you mentioned, right, now with what has remained constant is this relationship and they tried to break it. They tried everything. I'm talking about the regional countries and the GCC tried to break this relationship, but the Qatari leadership, you have to give them credit. They are very mature and long term sophisticated thinkers. They're not off. They're not whimsical off the cuff. They look truly at their strategic interests long term. And this is where both governments within Turkey and Qatar really share a commitment to the, the voice of the people, if you will. Now, and, and that is what drives their, their foreign policy and their relations. Now, I think the rest of them tried and now they gave up. And actually their relationship with each other has soured. It was with the, as I mentioned before, with the UAE in Saudi Arabia, very serious problems, not just in Yemen, but with trade and threats. Uh, so now we see each one going back to their former foes and say, hey, can, can we come back to a kind of healthy relationship? Saudi Arabia just signed a border deal with Qatar, right? And this was on hold for almost a decade and it was done, but it was on hold. And uh, so likewise, UAE reaching out to Turkey, as I had mentioned, but nonetheless, um, Israel is a huge factor and both Turkey and Qatar are adamant that without concessions to the Palestinians, there can be no quote unquote normalization in that sense. I think they should hold their ground that without concessions, there is no way that these either of these countries can can submit to this so-called normalization. I think that's an interesting perspective. I'll come to that actually later on. But now let's uh, move on to Kadir from Washington, D.C., whether he would like to pick on any of the issues that you raised or he would like to pose his own question. Um, thank you, Farhan, for joining us. And thank you, uh, Talib I, I think what uh, Farhan mentioned, uh, the, you know, the re sharing of the regional perspective between Turkey and Qatar is critical and it's not new. It started with especially the start of the Arab Spring where, you know, new um, sort of forces emerged in the region, not just the Muslim Brotherhood, but uh, common people demanding a different kind of, uh, you know, administration from their governments that have been authoritarian for decades. And Turkey, uh, was very involved uh, from the beginning. Uh, we remember President Erdogan calling on, you know, mo um, on Mubarak to step down in Egypt. He did that even before the U.S. If I remember correctly, U.S. never fully really asked for it because for other reasons. But starting from there, uh, Turkey imagined a new uh, region with much more responsive governments, governments responsive to their people's demands and uh, aspirations. And Qatar did play to the regional um, sort of the, the regional influence game rather well. Uh, we know the sort of outsized impact of influence of Al Jazeera, um, uh, but um, that leadership role in the region uh, like Farhan said uh, UAE was also uh, trying to do that or as a, as a counter uh, influence uh, against Qatar and they wanted to lead 
the charge in terms of Gulf's policy towards the region, then they supported along, alongside Saudi's uh, counter-revolutionary movement uh, in the region. And they were successful to some extent in Egypt. Egyptian coup, you know, the CC is there, he's, uh, he's succeeded. Uh, but of course, most recently, uh, more recently than that, 2017, Turkey's intervention to protect Qatar uh, against the blockade, against sanctions by the Gulf nations, was very critical. Turkey didn't hesitate to send, you know, troops, security forces there. And of course, I, I'll, I'll acknowledge uh, Qatari leadership's smart diplomacy, like Farhan mentioned. They didn't just, you know, uh, stick to Turkey. They went out to the West. They spoke to their U.S. counterparts. Uh, President Trump, remember his initial tweet about um, uh, he was supporting the blockade in his initial tweet, but then he had to backtrack later on uh, because U.S. has serious assets in in Qatar. So Qatar played to that regional uh, leadership role and then you know, it created reaction by its close neighbors like the UAE and Saudi Arabia, but then uh, Turkey's support was critical. Most recently, the regional dynamics are changing once again with the incoming Biden administration's, uh, you know, efforts to pivot to Asia, whatever that means. It doesn't mean leaving the region, I think it means uh, readjusting and paying less costs in the region. So a lot of uh, countries are now trying to readjust. Uh, this includes UAE, Saudi, you know, UAE is even reaching out to Iran, not just Turkey. Only 2017, they were asking Qatar to cut its relations with Turkey and Iran, but it took only three and a half years for them to uh, you know, pay a visit to Turkey, pay a visit to Iran. So the new, I think I've advocated for, not advocated, but I've, I've been on, of the opinion uh, for a long time that, you know, the regional stability will only come through with, in my eyes, four major regional players, uh, how they cooperate with each other and how they work with each other. This is Turkey, Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt and the Gulf nations of Qatar and UAE, uh, they have significant influence on certain things uh, because of their, you know, uh, strength in certain areas and their, how they um, sort of play the, that regional game is very crucial. So we are seeing that readjustment, realignment uh, period right now uh, Turkey has mentioned that it will speak to Egypt, it will speak to Israel, like Parhan mentioned, Palestine, Erdogan just said today, Palestine will be important, Turkey will never abandon the Palestinians. But we are uh, moving towards a new regional, uh, I think, uh, configuration where less tensions, because there's no US promising to or threatening to bomb Iran you know, and then you have to pick a side what to do, right? That's not the reality in the region right now. So we are seeing quite a few readjustments and realignments, and hopefully that's good news for the region overall uh, for stability. Okay, thank you. Uh, Farhan, uh, maybe I can ask a question if you don't mind. No, not at all, Dr. Um, from the Qatari perspective, most recent visit, of, of Erdogan and he's he's always talking to Emir he's you know mm -hmm. they they paid a, a lot of uh, visits to each other what the the most current one which was yesterday you ended yesterday uh how was it perceived in Qatar happy birthday Baba. <laughs> happy. I, I would like to say this first of all thank you very much Qatar. I actually completely agree with your analysis I think it's well said, well put. Now, coming to Qatari's sentiment, I've been here for 14 years. Mm -hmm. And what I, in a way, in, if, one, if I may, in one word, say, how does your typical Qatari 
feel when uh, they are uh, aware that President Erdogan is coming to their country? Total uh, enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. That's it's enthusiasm that is visible on people's faces when you go through the majlises, even at the university with the students. There is a deep appreciation, and you had mentioned it too, uh, Dr. Kader. But I would kind of I want to highlight that that yes. Turkey's support and unequivocal support, even though at that time Saudi Arabia was trying to entice Turkey not to give the kind of support that it was giving Qatar, but Turkey's support at that critical time is cemented in the collective shared imaginary of the Qatari people. And you can see it every time uh, President Erdogan comes to Qatar he is received by the, the, the top royal family members, including His Highness Sheikh Tamim. And they have a great rapport with one another, a great relationship. And you know, irrespective of what we learn in academia on politics and how it's about maslaha or it's about interest, the reality, the real reality of the depth of any relationship is based on trust. And so, and that is, of course, almost ignored completely in the Western political canon. But a real, genuine, long-standing political alliance is based on trust. And what we see from the Qatari perspective, and also reciprocated from the Turkish perspective, is there is this trust they have with one another, and 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 they will not leave one another. And I can tell you that from what I've heard already. Economic deals have been signed. You know, they're deepening their defense relationship. Turkey, of course, and this has been talked about too by so many people, its drone technology is a game changer, you know, uh, a global game changer. So we can almost consider it as powerful as, you know, Orban's top, Orban's cannon uh, in the medieval times, but this is equivalent in, in, in some analysis to that canon that was developed historically that the Ottomans had developed. So uh, I just wanted to kind of share that thought with you that yes, there is this deep appreciation of trust and a great enthusiasm in anything, you know, Turkish language, Turkish restaurants. If you go here, you know, all the Turkish restaurants are full. You, they're full and other ones will be empty, but Mado will be full, you know, uh, Pasha Karafirin. There, there are so many here now that have opened, right? Simit Sarai now has about six locations, I believe. So uh, I, there is this kind of goodwill that is it's very natural and it's, it's with the people. So they definitely do appreciate. Now, I would just want to add one final comment before I hand it back to you is that I would hope that this relationship doesn't stop here. It should form the foundation of a much larger grouping. I believe it's critical to bring Pakistan on board, bring, you know, Azerbaijan more closely involved, work on the other countries to kind of convince them to join this. This block should enlarge and it should share its technologies, its science, it's cultural, educational, <coughs> excuse me, you name it. This could prove to be the source of peace and stability in the broader region. And it has to start with two people, two nations. I think we have that now, but it should expand. Thank you. Well, Farhan, thank you very much. I think you have uh, looked at the different dimensions of the relations between Qatar and Turkey, and I think the relations are so deeply now uh, rooted uh, and but what I am interested in, how this you know, strong relationship can really unfold in the regional politics. You said, for example, that uh, you know, both countries are asking Israel to, have, uh, to give some concessions in order to you know, have a constructive dialogue with the Palestinians. Right. As you would remember, when the Arab Abrahamic agreement uh, was signed, and some of the Arab countries have accepted it, and there was no uh, strings attached to it, and there was no expectation from the Israeli government. But they have tried to legitimize this agreement by rep making references to the 
you know, the, uh, let's say, positive impact of that Abrahamic trade, the, the accord for the, for the Palestinians. But when you ask Palestinians, they say, you know, they have uh, nothing uh, to gain from such uh, agreement. How, to what extent do you think Turkey and Qatar uh, can uh, contribute to that process by uh, putting more pressure on Israel and actually also maybe uh, reaching out to the wider Arab world that they should be more careful when they are dealing with, uh, with Israel in order to protect the rights of Palestinians? I think it's a fantastic question. I would say in a word, spin. Politics is about spin. So the Israelis have spun the Arab uh, Abraham Accords as something that was proving beneficial, just like they've always spun a tale of it's always the Palestinians that have lost an opportunity never to lose an opportunity. But it's just rhetoric and it's spin. There is no truth. There's no reality to this. The Palestinian lives are still horribly, you know, contained by this Israeli, uh, you know, hegemon. So, but at the same time, it's also about understanding this kind of a ploy and game. And then, look, both Qatar and Turkey have the muscle, military and economic, and they have shown the commitment to follow through with their and to protect their red lines, no matter what the cost. And I believe that for countries, this is essential. If you don't stand by your red lines, countries like people will laugh at you. And Turkey has made it very clear, even if it's Russia on the other side or America, these are our red lines and people respect that. And, and Qatar has done the same. And so together, there's a lot of, they're a heavyweight in more ways than one. And the Israelis recognize that this is the block of the future. So they're trying to get in now so they can give as little as possible, hoping, and they will. They will offer way more than what they had even given lip service to offer to the Saudis and Emiratis, because basically they just bent over and said, listen, whatever you want, we will listen. Um, but neither the Israelis truly respect that and definitely not the people in the region. And so this is where I think it's, it's more likely because the Israelis know they know the Turkish power and the threat, and they know this relationship with Qatar is deep, and that adds to their worry. So they're trying to reach out now behind the scenes and trying to kind of patch things up before it gets worse for them. Well, I think now uh, I have got a similar question to Qatar, but from a U.S. perspective, because you know Israel has been always uh, very close to U.S. and it, it, during the Trump era, we have seen this agreement, Abrahamic Accord. And what will be the position of U.S. Uh, Qatar as far as this agreement is concerned, and the reconciliation between some Arab countries and Israel at the expense of the Palestinians? What will be the uh, main position and the line of the uh, Biden administration? Well, they have largely um, sort of approved of this agreement and, you know, there's not any, there's very little critical uh, voices against it. But I think it also hasn't achieved a whole lot uh, other than uh, some of the, you know, UAE's relationship uh, has improved with Israel, but at the regional sense in terms of achieving peace and stability and then achieving anything for the, you know, now defunct uh, peace process, uh, it hasn't done much. So I think people who closely uh, watch the region and closely care about the peace process, uh, they see that Abraham Accords uh, haven't achieved a lot. But when you're looking at the administration's position, um, obviously they, you know, uh, they approve of uh, Israel's normalization with uh, Arab countries in the region. Uh, but there's also a recognition that, you know, in the Democratic Party, there's a strong now progressive uh, wing uh, who, is, who is openly critical of Israel. And uh, Netanyahu had made the Israel issue quite a partisan one during uh, Trump and prior to that with with, um, with Obama. Remember, he 
came to Washington and then he um, kind of indirectly criticized Obama, made a speech at Congress. Anyway, he had he made the Israel issue uh, not a partisan issue. So uh, on the one hand, uh, support for Israel continues in Washington, uh, but there are many more detractors uh, from within the Democratic Party, uh, from the progressive wing. But at the same time, I think there's also a realization that there is no <clears throat> real prospect for uh, the peace process to successfully produce two, two countries, uh, I mean two states. Uh, so there's a lot of souring on the idea that uh, you know, there is going to be actually two states and the Biden administration is staying away from promising anything uh, and declaring any kind of peace process agenda. So uh, there are these competing uh, sort of dynamics in, in many ways. On the one hand, you do support Israel. On the other hand, uh, your, you know, progressive wing is very harshly critical of Israeli policies, uh, but then you don't really want to do anything on the peace process. So it's an interesting time. I, I think uh, what I mentioned earlier, the regional players kind of trying to talk to each other now uh, is to some extent driven from this fact that Washington has less interest in playing a big role in the region. OK, thank you, Kadir. Sorry, Kadir. I no got worry. some warning. Yeah, OK. Um, OK, thank you, Kadir, for your uh, analysis of the US role in the in the Middle East. Now, let me uh, go on to uh, Farhan again. Uh, we have been talking about the uh, impact of the relations between Qatar and Turkey. Yes, uh, you know, bilateral relations are very strong economically, culturally and politically. But I think, as you have said, this will be an example in the region and it is so solid and some other maybe uh, countries should also join that block. But in order to in order that happen should happen, there must be some sort of uh, uh, avenues that you know both countries can uh, work together. Maybe uh, Afghanistan is a case, maybe uh, Syria or Libya are other cases. Now let's start start from uh, from Libya because it seems that Turkey and Qatar are on the same page as far as the future of Libya is concerned because they are both supporting the UN um, recognized government vis-a-vis uh, -vis Haftar. What will be the role of these two countries to bring more stability uh, in, in Libya? I think it's a very, very important but perplexing question because of all the serious interests even of France of Italy, you know, behind of the US um, that are in many ways not supporting, you know, the UN recognized government. So this is posing to be a major challenge. But nonetheless, like you mentioned, right, we need examples of these two countries working together to achieve a certain objective. I think that they should definitely coordinate more in Libya. I think we already see that coordination starting to emerge in Turkey. Right. And I see a potential for that with Turkey's experience in the Horn of Africa, especially in Somalia, that they can learn and benefit from the experience of one another. And they have to facilitate ways to do this and, and get even more comfortable, but not stop there. I think that and like I had mentioned before, right, I think it's critical for both countries to pursue their own camaraderie and the depth of their own partnership with the clear idea where they want to go for the future. And as Dr. Qadir had mentioned that, look, the Arab Spring really, really kind of catapulted both countries together because both held such deep views that, you know, the unrepresentative leadership and di authoritarian dictatorships throughout the region have been a plague in the region. Uh, culturally, economically, uh, militarily, on every level, they've been a plague. So what we see and what we sh what they are actually supporting is this kind of reversal, right? This reversal of these faux pas leaders or these unrepresentative leaders that have not taken their their society anywhere. Like you know, I always remember something that when my mother-in-law is speaking to me of Turkey 
40, 50 years ago. So she's telling me that they used to take shampoo from Germany. I said, shampoo from Germany to, to the Ottoman Empire? Imagine the place where they had really mastered coffee for, for the, you name it, the spices and all the, shampoo even is a word that is not, it's not European, right? So, so how did that, how did society go backwards? A society that was fluent in several languages, right? Like the Ottoman Empire, several languages, all the leadership and the people in the, the majlises. So how did it go backwards? How did it lose that? So um, I think part of that loss had to do with this abnormal and kind of forced leadership that had emerged in the region that was suffocating it. And now what you see is that the natural leadership is kind of re-emerging, that it is not antagonistic to its own traditions and society and language. And it's almost like a course correction to trying to get back on track. So it's naturally though, that they be aware of where they are in history and they have to be aware of where they, they should go. But I am absolutely, uh, I agree with you, uh, Dr. Talib, about the emphasis and, and Libya should be one in which they make it clear it's a red line. This is a UN uh, mandated respected government and anyone who tries to undermine that government uh, should be called out and Turkey should make it very clear that it will not tolerate any adventurism. Kadir, are you going to say anything or uh, I have got more questions to Farhan if you don't have any. Talib Hocam, maybe you can comment a few minutes if we have time, I think, about, you know, there was an MBZ visit to Turkey. We talked about this. We did an uh, uh, we did one show on this uh, and now very shortly after uh, Erdogan is is in Qatar. Uh, do you do you how do you see that? Um, uh, is that trying to strike a balance with, in terms of relations with the Gulf? Well, actually, Turkey, you know, there has been a discussion uh, in Turkey for the last maybe 10 years since since the start of the Arab Spring, because, you know, Turkey had some strange relationship with some of the uh, Arab countries. And there was an expectation from the public as well as uh, from the opposition parties in Turkey, even within within the governing party as well, that there should be some sort of retuning of the foreign policy of Turkey in order to overcome some of the challenges that we have been facing, because it is not in the interest of Turkey, neither it is in the interest of uh, other countries. Therefore, uh, Turkey started uh, having talks with the uh, United Arab Emirates and also of course, the relationship between Qatar and Turkey had been well established, and this visit actually it it, it was pre-arranged. It is not uh, arranged uh, because of the visit of the uh, uh, UAE uh, to to Turkey. I, that's why this is seen as uh, part of maybe normalization is not the word that Ferhan likes, but in Turkey it's been seen as so as some sort of normalization of the uh, relations because you remember just before the Arab Spring, the relations uh, you know between Turkey and most of the Arab countries, including the Gulf countries, uh, almost uh, perfect. I mean, they they reached uh, their summit in terms of. Uh, in political leadership, uh, in terms of economic relations, etc. But as Farhan said, Turkey was the voice of the people uh, with that of Qatar, and that has changed many things. But I think there is a now uh, understanding uh, between the countries that Turkey was not really interfering in the uh, business of the uh, Arab countries, just supporting some of the demands coming from people. Here, I think I, we need to maybe uh, turn to Farhan in order to understand Turkey's uh, not role, not position maybe, how it is perceived in the, in the Arab world, because uh, some Arab intellectuals and people in the media and some academics as well, they have argued that Turkey was intervening in the domestic issues of the Arab people when there was this, uh, you know, Arab Spring. Uh, uh, Farhan, can you comment on that? I mean, whether Turkey was seen as an interventionist power in the region, uh, what, whether it is still the same or there's a change of mood uh, uh, there as well? I think it's a very important question. I think all of the above. It absolutely depends who you're speaking to. If you are speaking to people who are more spiritually inclined, then they see Turkey as a partner, as a friend, as a brother. 
and they do not look at it as problematic that they have a, a voice in the region or for that matter in their neighborhood right when it comes to arab nationalists or secular nationalists they will look at turkey with a mixture of envy and dread and then there will be hostility but there'll also be uh, you know a covetness so, you know why can't our societies be like that so um those definitely coming from a secular national nationalistic background they will see turkey as trying to use its islamic credentials the sunni credentials and then not only will you know iran kind of at times oppose this and you can just follow the iranian newspapers unfortunately the one country in the entire middle eastern region here that is not sectarian to the core not sectarian is turkey but you will find the iranian newspapers full and focused on criticizing turkey not of saudi arabia so it's a very interesting right but that's tactical that's intentional right that's not accidental so i believe they all see the potential and the threat um because of the the character and the history and the civilizational ethos and power that turkey has so of course so it depends who you're going to be talking to dr talib right so if you're going to be talking to people and this is where ideology is so important people pretend that it's not nobody is neutral they may pretend but even to say you're not neutral is not neutral because you've taken a stance on something right but one of the the myths of academia is this you know the need to pretend to be objective when nobody really is and so to call that out i believe is important that people are inclined to certain narratives and world views that shape their attitude towards turkey and and i've heard people that have made comments and worried is turkey restarting the, the ottoman empire even if it was what would that be a problem for you where would that be a problem for you and what makes it problematic for you, for anybody so rather than get on the defensive i would flip it around and say well why do you have a problem with muslim society cherishing or championing their own cultural history or legacy while i i i refer to the ottoman empire as the ottoman khalifat right but also many people may not describe it as a khalifat they may limit the khalifat to only the khulafa rashidun and then nothing afterward or maybe include certain arab as you had rightly asked uh, dr talib that how do people within the region view turkey and what i noticed is that it very much depends upon the narratives and the world views that they have so when you're speaking of people with a with a arab secular nationalistic perspective they view turkey as a as a threat they look at turkey with envy but at the same time and they also are kind of reminded of these caricatures these kind of grotesque foolish really irrational caricatures how the ottomans took people's food so this is what people have actually said in front of me without exaggeration and when i would ask for evidence on why they would have but these type of myths have been perpetuated to give you another example and i i want to share this because it was so deeply offended me i've been in qatar since 2008 and when i was first attending the national day celebrations we had a very small event that took place on a uh, university campus and it was an absurd display of racism so allow me to explain what happened was they would show uh about six or seven arabian horsemen attack a similar amount of ottoman soldiers kill them and then celebrate this was in 2008 how national day was celebrated and so when i looked at this story i said this never happened but this is what is taught even in the schools in the the arabic schools so when i dug deeper i said who was responsible for this because i actually filed a complaint i said this is uh this is a racist kind of display and it's factually incorrect and what you'll know and all of us here you know mashallah we are aware 
of the significance of who writes history, they're relying on British textbooks of Qatari history, and which tells us tale in which the Qataris fought against the Ottomans, and they they embellished this story, and then they they made this. And the person responsible for this entire, what I would think of as a despicable display of anti. Ottoman anti-Turkish history was, you know, someone who was neither from the majority Muslim community within the region, nor from the region. It was an outsider that was responsible for holding the Qatar National Day event. And this is, when I approached them, I said, why did you do this? You know, this is, and, and I think it's intentional. If I can be absolutely blunt and unforgiving, it is intentional. It is a way to exacerbate the differences between people, play on people's fears, and they do it through education, they do it through books. And this entire history has been debunked by Zekeria, Professor Zekeria Kursun, who's written on this using firsthand sources and whose book then I distributed to my classes. When he talked about, imagine the significance of that. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in that regard, uh, but basically it's the narrative that they hold to. Farhan, thank you for bringing that up. Of course, I'm a historian by training and there's a lot of things to discuss about that. Uh, yeah. You know, nationalist histories always define these others and enemies like that. Uh, but maybe that's for another session. We want to close with a uh, question, very current question, uh, the, the status of negotiations between Turkey and Qatar about uh, cooperation uh, about the airport in Kabul, uh, the operation, who's going to operate, who's going to protect it. Do you have any insights, most recent information about that? Actually, I do have some interesting insights because, you know, my close associations here in actually several of the embassies. So what's interesting is that the UAE embassy uh, was paying a lot to have control over the, uh, you know, Afghan airport. Uh, a tremendous amount of money. And you know that there is this kind of jostling, right, even between different Afghan factions that yeah. the uh, Abdul Ghani is actually there and a lot of his entourage ends up there. And that's been a home for many people, especially anti-Taliban factions, is UAE. So I'm actually surprised even the Taliban would consider it. But because of the financial difficulties they're facing, they kind of were leaning towards the UAE. And then what Qatar decided, which I think was an absolutely brilliant move, is that they put in a joint proposal for Turkey and Qatar to together. Mm -hmm. Uh, run the airport, do training, military training, and they were going to, you know, bring in Pakistan where necessary. So it's it's a, a collective effort uh, mm -hmm. that is based on both Qatar and Turkey, but also bringing in and having, you know, Pakistan on board. So, and then also including the region. So it's a much smarter collective kind of, but there's been no final decision that I know, but I do, just in regards to that, I know that the proposal has been sent and I know the deep affinity that the, the Taliban do hold for Turkey. And I think that that should definitely be kind of, that should be taken into consideration. So I'm hoping and I'm hopeful that that will produce a positive result. Thank you. Tadi Pujam. But I think we come to the end of uh, our program. This episode was fantastic. Thank you very much, Farhan, for joining us. And Kadir, thank you for your comments and analysis. So thank we you. have to say goodbye to goodbye to our audience. Uh, see you next time. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you.